thank you again, as always, for leading us in worship this morning. What an amazing song. I, was, I shared this in the first service. I have to share it again. Um, you just had one of those days, you know, everything goes wrong in the morning. And this song was such an incredible reminder, but it's particularly before the first service, to just kind of refocus myself that this is all about Jesus. Today has been one of those days for us. And this might have happened to you. We had that thunderstorm last night. We lost power. We realized our fan stopped at about 12.30 this morning. So we realized we had lost power. Went outside. I checked the main breaker. You know how we all have to find that outside our house. I checked the main breaker, and it was still good. So I thought, all right, we lost power in the neighborhood. It'll be good by the time we get up this morning. It was not good by the time we got up this morning. Still, 5.30, still no power in the house. And so I thought, all right, well, let me, let me come up here to the church and see if there's power up here at the church. And so as I'm getting in the car, I caught my fingers in the car door. And I drive up here, realize there was, in fact, power in the church. So now it began an hour frantic search of trying to call the electric company with my very limited Italian to figure out why in the world we don't have electricity only to realize we do have a second main breaker in our house that all it would have taken was to flip that switch in the first place and we would have been okay. And then as I was walking out to the car, I stepped in a little present my little dog left in the yard. And then my shoes didn't match my pants, so then I had to go back in and change all my clothes. So it's just been one of those days where stuff is sort of piled on top of things. And as I realized, I said, you know, this is today's message is one of those messages the enemy does not want us to talk about does not want us to hear. You see in your, in your bulletin the title of the message this morning, Is Jesus Lord or Was He Just a Good Man? Now you remember we're in the third week of our Got Questions apologetic series. And we've been asking questions, certainly not trying to answer all of the questions about Christianity. It's only a four-week week series. We certainly couldn't do that. Certainly not trying to answer all of the questions, but the biggies. We want to answer some of the big questions. We started a couple of weeks ago, you remember, and we looked at the issue of the reliability of God's word. Can we trust it to be historically accurate? Can we trust it to be a reliable uh, retelling of the events that took place? But more importantly, can we trust it to be the very word of God? And then last week, we looked at the problem of evil and suffering, a challenge and a problem that many people have concerning their relationship with God. How can a God who is infinitely good and how can a God who is infinitely powerful allow evil and suffering to continue in this world? And then this morning, we come to the question. This question is the one that, that parts the waters, so to speak, where religions are concerned. And that is the, the question about who is this one named Jesus and what are we to understand about him? Now, as I've done with the previous uh, couple of messages, I want to give you a couple of other resources. Uh, we've only got about 20 minutes or so I'm going to spend uh, in the text this morning. And so I want to give you some other resources. We're really going to scratch the surface of this, and I want to dive deeper. And as we get into it, you may want me to dive deeper, but we do uh, have a time consideration to think about. So let me give you a couple of the resources you want to dig in a little bit further about this. Uh, Lee Strobel's book, The Case for Christ. Lee Strobel, if you're not aware, was an atheist journalist for the Chicago Sun-Times. Um, he set out using his journalistic skills, and his goal was going to be to disprove the claims of Christianity. And as he dug deeper, dug into the Word, dug into the facts, came to realize that the reasonable response was to trust in Christ as a Savior, and did that, as, and then subsequently written several books in this sort of the Case for series. Now, the case for faith, the case for Christ, the case for the historical Jesus, the case for, for Easter and the resurrection. This book specifically deals with the matter we're talking about this morning. That is, was Jesus Lord or was he just a good man? The other reference, and I'll mention this a little bit more in the service, or in the sermon rather, a book by Josh McDowell called Evidence That Demands a Verdict. He wrote volume two, More Evidence That Demands a Verdict. He also wrote a book with his son, Evidence for the Resurrection. And so a couple of great resources if you want to dig a little bit further into this topic of who was Jesus. Well, this morning, join me in Matthew 16. I'm here in Matthew 16. Jesus has a conversation, particularly with Peter, but I'm, he's having it with all of the disciples. We get to see specifically his conversation with Peter. And as he's conversing, he asks them this very question. Who do people say that I am? And then maybe more importantly, more to the point, who do you say that I am? These are the critical questions that... We want to answer, and I want us to look at those things that Jesus said. 
Did he really believe he was the Son of God, or did he merely see himself as a teacher or a prophet? And then I want to look at some of the things that could lead us to that conclusion, that he was, in fact, Lord and God and much more than just a prophet. And so I want to spend some time looking at those things. And then, as with all other topics we've looked at, I want to spend a few minutes at the end just asking the question, all right, what are we to do with all of this? This is great information. Now what? How am I so supposed to respond to these things? So I want to start with the question, first question Jesus starts with, who did people say he was? And in fact, who do people say he is today? The question still remains. We'll start there in verse 13 of Matthew 16. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now, let me stop there for just a minute. Take a pen, if you have a, particularly if you have a hard copy of the Bible. If you have an e-reader, I don't know how this works. But take a pen and underline that phrase, Son of Man. That's an important title. We're going to talk about that in a little bit. That, that title is important for our, our, our understanding of who Jesus saw himself to be. So you just underline that title, Son of Man. Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, well, some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and others Jeremiah, and, and still others, some of the prophets. Now, without going into too much detail about these guys, John the Baptist, Elijah, and Jeremiah, there are some things that they had in common that are particularly relevant to why people would have answered that way when Jesus asked, who do people say I am? First of all, all of those men were considered good men. Now, they weren't always necessarily um, seen as, as men that people wanted to follow after. I mean, John the Baptist, we talked about him during VBS. John the Baptist was a little bit weird. He lived in the wilderness. He wore camel hair as clothes. He ate bugs. He was just a little bit off center. Elijah, God asked Elijah to do some strange things. These guys were seen as just a little bit weird. But, but there was a respect, a reverence. People saw them as good men. There was no question about their integrity, no question about their uprightness before the Lord. They were seen as good men. The other thing is there was no question and no doubt that they were all prophets. Now, as in the prophetic ministry, people didn't always like what they had to say. Uh, John the Baptist was, was beheaded for some of the things that he had said. Elijah found himself on the run from King Ahab and Jezebel for the things that he said, but they were true to God's word. And isn't that the way it is? Whenever we make a stand, even to this day, Whenever we make a stand for God's word and we're uncompromising about the, the truth of God's word, our message is not always going to be popular. I was working with, with Daniel Alexander this past week on work, helping him on an assignment he's, he's working on for a class he's taking. And he asked me, what's the biggest challenge you face as a pastor? And I said, well, the biggest challenge I face as a pastor is the same challenge that every believer faces. And in fact, the same challenge every believer for all of time has faced. And that is this issue that when we take a stand for the truth of God's word, it doesn't make us popular. People don't always want to see us coming. They don't always want to see us around. And that was the case with the prophets, but there was no doubt in people's minds that what they spoke when they said, thus saith the Lord, that that's exactly what they meant, that they were prophets of God. And all three in one way or the other were believed to be forerunners of the Messiah. John the Baptist and Elijah, certainly by, by prophecy, they were said to have be forerunners of the Messiah. Jeremiah, certainly by this time, by tradition, was seen as a forerunner of the Messiah. And this gives us a significant insight into how people saw Jesus. When Jesus asked the question, what do people, who do people say that I am? And these responses came out. Here's what we can pull away from that. People saw him as a good man. That's the same way people re re respond to him now. People saw him as a prophet. People saw him as a good teacher, but they did not see him as the Messiah. That's the, that's the takeaway for us at that point. These men were good men, prophets, forerunners to the Messiah, but nobody saw them as the Messiah himself, and rightfully so. But that gives us insight as to what people thought of Jesus in that day. And this is the key issue even to today. This is the matter that is before people, the challenge that they have. I don't believe he was the son of God. And as I mentioned in the intro, this is kind of the places where religions part company. And it's at this point, I think,
for sure that we can say that Christianity and Islam, for example, don't worship the same God by different names. Now, I don't say that uh, to, be, to be intolerant, and I don't say that to be hateful, and I don't say that to be bigoted. I do say it for this reason, that there is such a contradiction between who the Bible says Jesus is and who the Quran says Jesus is, that those two teachings cannot have come from the same God. Let me give you some examples. For example, the Bible says that Jesus is the Son of God. The Quran says that God has no sons or daughters. The Bible says that Jesus died on a cross. The Quran said that someone who looked like him died on the cross, but Jesus did not. The Bible says that Jesus was resurrected, the Quran, so we didn't die, so he certainly was not resurrected. The Bible says that Jesus is the Messiah. The Quran claims he is a prophet, presents him in a very positive light as an exalted prophet, but ultimately sort of second fiddle to Muhammad. We have these very contradictory accounts when it comes to this most critical question, who is Jesus? And both of those books claim to be the word of God. But one says Jesus is God. The other says he is not. Both cannot be right and both absolutely cannot be from the same God. God certainly would know either Jesus is his son or he is not. And, and as it comes to this matter of Jesus as Messiah, that's the claim he's making here. I mentioned for you to underline that phrase, that title, son of man. That's a significant title. In fact, it was Jesus' favorite way to refer to himself. I was looking at John MacArthur's commentary on Matthew, and he said this phrase, Son of Man, is used 80 times in the New Testament. Now, I didn't go back and check his math. I trust John MacArthur's scholarship on that, that if he's that's probably true. But there's no doubt that this was Jesus' favorite way to refer to himself. And it's a cool sound and sort of religious-y sound and title, isn't it? to claim that you are the son of man. It sounds very sort of mystical, all reverent, almost demands reverence. But it was more than that. It was more than a cool and memorable, mystic-y sounding title. To this Jewish audience, they would have heard a great deal more when Jesus claimed that title, son of man. Now, the other thing I want you to do in your Bible, you've already underlined son of man. It's okay to write in your Bible, by the way. That's not a sin. You can write. I, I gave you permission today. It's okay to do that. Write out just next to Matthew 6.13, in the margin there, write Daniel 7.13. When, and, and I encourage you later on, go back and look up that prophecy in Daniel chapter 7. I'm going to give you the Reader's Digest version this morning. This is what they would have heard when Jesus claimed the title, Son of Man. There's a prophecy the prophet Daniel gets, gives in Daniel chapter 7. He says, the Son of Man will come riding on the clouds. He will be given authority by God to judge the nations, and all of the nations will worship him. Now, when Jesus claims this title, this is a significant claim to who he saw himself to be. It's significant because, of course, only God is to be worshipped. In Acts chapter 14, Paul and Barnabas are ministering, and the people come and they, and they start to believe that they are Greek gods. That, that Barnabas is Zeus and that Paul is Hermes, and they fall down and they worship Paul and Barnabas. And Paul and Barnabas said, get up, we're just men, don't worship us, worship only God. The book of the Revelation, Revelation chapter 22, the angel is showing John these end times events, these wonderful things that will happen that will mark the end of times. And John is so overwhelmed by those, I believe, he falls down to worship the angel. The angel says, get up, man. I'm just a servant just like you. Don't worship me. Worship only God. It's a significant claim that Jesus claims that title where the Son of Man is worshipped. He is claiming to be God himself. And only God can stand as the judge of the nations. And here comes Jesus making the claim that he is the one that will do that. It's a clear claim to be the Messiah, to be God in the flesh. C.S. Lewis said this in his book, Mere Christianity. He said, I'm trying here. This is a wonderful claim. This is a wonderful quote, by the way. I absolutely love this quote. If you haven't read that book, Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, grab it. It's not a hard read, a couple hundred pages. But this is what C.S. Lewis said. He said, I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about him. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. That is the one thing we must not say. 
a man who was merely a man and said the sorts of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would be a lunatic on the level with a man who says he's a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. And you must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God, or else a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, and you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. And Jesus, in asking the question even, he lays out his claim that he is much more than just a prophet much more than just a good man, much more than what this world might assume him to be, that he is the very Messiah, the Son of God, come in the flesh. But I think that leads us naturally to the next question. Is there reason to believe that? Jesus makes the claim that he is the Son of Man, the Messiah. Is there reason to believe that that is true? Just because he claimed it. C.S. Lewis kind of hints at this. Just because he claimed it. He could have been wrong. He could have been intentionally wrong in trying to deceive. He could have been wrong and delusional about who he was. Just because he made that claim, do we have reason to accept that it is true? Or is it, as some would suggest, that, that really the, Jesus didn't see himself as deity. The disciples didn't see him as deity. Nobody really in the first century, they would say, saw him as God. That was added years and years and years later to, to bolster the claims that the church made about him. Is that so, or do we have reason to believe that Jesus was, in fact, the Messiah? Well, I think if we look back, the first thing we see is that he perfectly matched the description of the Old, the Old Testament description of the Messiah. And I think this is perhaps the most powerful argument to the identity of who Jesus really was, the Old Testament prophecies concerning the Messiah. Several of these given several hundred years before Jesus would walk this earth. Now at Christmas time, we open up the, God, uh, the book of Isaiah, and we read several prophecies from the book of Isaiah. One of them we read comes from Isaiah chapter 9, and, and he's describing the Messiah. And this is what he said. You'll recognize these words as very Christmassy when I say them. This is what he says about the Messiah. That he will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God. Are you there in Christmas mode? I'm already in Christmas mode, but there you are. Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Do you realize what Isaiah is saying? That whoever is the Messiah is the Almighty God. Whoever is the Messiah is the Everlasting Father. Father, that the Messiah and God are one and the same. And so for Jesus to make the claim that he is the Messiah, he is claiming to be God. Fast forward a little bit into Isaiah, into chapter 53. Isaiah gives a further description about what will happen to the Messiah. Now, we have the benefit of looking back and saying, well, we're in the 21st century. We have the benefit of history to be able to look back and when we read this description in Isaiah 53, Instantly, it pops in our mind who he's talking about. They wouldn't have had that. They, they knew, I think, it was of the Messiah, but they wouldn't have known it was this man, Jesus. But you listen to this description that Isaiah gives of the Messiah in, in, in Isaiah 53. I'm going to paraphrase it. He said he was despised and rejected by men. He bore our suffering, punished by God, pierced for our transgressions. All of our iniquity was laid on him. He was killed despite the fact that he was innocent. He bore the sins of many, and he made intercession for sinners. And as we realize who Jesus is, his person, his life, his ministry, his work, we can read those words. We can't think of anyone else. It fits him perfectly to a T. By the way, those words were written 700 years before Jesus walked the face of this earth, pointing to who the Messiah would be. And there are nearly 50 major prophecies about the Messiah that point out things like this, the, the, where, that he would be born of a virgin, a very specific discussion about the consequences of his birth, that he would be born in Bethlehem, where he would be born, of the tribe of Judah, of the line of David. There's a, a prophecy about the fact that he would be betrayed, the exact price, 30 pieces of silver, that, he would, be pay, that would be paid for his betrayal that his hands and feet would be pierced at death, even though crucifixion was centuries from being invented, even a prophecy about his 
resurrection. And those are just eight, just eight of the prophecies. And in that book, Evidence That Demands a Verdict, this is what Josh McDowell said. He said, the probability of any one person fulfilling just eight, I just gave you eight, fulfilling those eight messianic prophecies is one chance in 100 million billion. The chance that one person would fulfill all eight of those prophecies is mathematically impossible. And he goes on. He said the probability of anyone fulfilling all 48 of them is one chance in 10 with 157 zeros behind it. The chance that somebody could fulfill all of those prophecies and not be the Messiah is absolutely mathematically impossible. And Jesus comes and fulfills every single one of them. And I think that's the most powerful argument to who Jesus was. He claimed to be the Messiah, and the circumstances of his life bore that out. He fulfilled every one of those prophecies. But isn't it possible, the skeptic will argue, isn't it possible that the gospel writers, knowing those prophecies, just altered the details of Jesus' life to make it look like he fulfilled those prophecies? Well, I'll concede it might be possible, but it's absolutely not probable. See, the, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and they're called the synoptics because they kind of give a synopsis of the same events. Those synoptic gospels were certainly written within a generation or two of Jesus' crucifixion. Many of the people that were living at that time when those stories were circulated, they were there at those events. They were alive at that time. They certainly would have pointed out errors. No, those things you said about the crucifixion, his legs not being broken, for example, that's not true. I was there. I saw it. They certainly would have pointed out errors. And the Jews, most definitely, the Jews would have pointed out errors. You remember how desperate they were to change the narrative about Jesus. After his resurrection, you remember, the Pharisees go to the Roman guards, and they offer the money, and they say, now, here's the, here's the story you're going to tell. They were absolutely just chomping at the bit to change the narrative about Jesus. If anything in here was untrue about who Jesus was or his life or his ministry, they would not have hesitated to correct those, in, those in, inaccuracies. And it just absolutely defies reason. These disciples, many of them, went to their graves defending these things they believed about Jesus. It absolutely defies reason that they would willingly be put to death for things that they knew were not true. And we, it's, it certainly is possible that the disciples just altered the facts to make it look like Jesus fulfilled prophecy, but it is not probable that that is so. And the miracles, it's one thing to say that you are the Messiah, the Son of God. It's a whole other thing to back it up. It's one thing to say you can give sight to the blind. It's another thing to do it. It's one thing to say you can make the lame walk. It's another thing to do it. It's one thing to say you can raise the dead. It's a whole other matter to actually do it. And the miracles and the, the prophecies all point to the fact that Jesus was who he said he was. And we can look at those facts and say we do have reason to believe. It's more than just his claim. His claim is backed up by the circumstances of his life. We have reason to believe Jesus was, in fact, who he claimed to be. And so let me just wrap our time up then with the, the last question. What are we to do with that? That's good information to know. It fills my head, and I'm glad that we, we spent that time. But what am I to do with that information? See, I don't believe that Jesus asked his disciples the question because they didn't know the answer. I don't think he wasn't aware of what people said about him. I don't think that's why he asked the question. I think he asked the question because he was setting up the question in verse 15. This, who, would, who do people say that I am. And then he sets it up to say, all right, here's the really important point. Here's where the rubber meets the road, so to speak. Who do you say that I am? Because it's this question, this one question that separates the sheep from the goats. It's this one question is the ultimate question that every human being will have to answer. Who do you say Jesus is? This one question your eternity and mine hangs in the balance of how we answer this one question. But it's more than just recognizing the facts, acknowledging the historical accuracy of who Jesus was and the facts about his life. It's more than that. Satan and his minions recognize who Jesus was. 
Anytime Jesus encountered a demon-possessed person, the demon would cry out, what do you want with us, son of God? The demons know very well who Jesus is. It's not just recognizing facts about him. I often kind of jokingly say that's kind of like having the Jesus Christ baseball card. You know what I'm talking about, baseball cards? They got a picture of a player on one side of the card. He's got that black goo under his eyes. I don't have any idea what that does, but it makes him look cool. And then he's in that, he's in some position, you know, that makes it look like he's ready to field a ground ball or something. And you flip the card over, and what's on the back of the card? All of his stats, right? His home runs, his batting average, his earned run average, if he's a pitcher, his age, height, weight, all that stuff. All his historical data is on the back of the card. And you can become really adept at knowing the facts about any one of those players from the back of that card, but you don't know the player. There's a difference between knowing facts about Jesus, recognizing the historical truth about him, and accepting him. And Jesus' answer to Peter in verse 17 indicates there is a spiritual response that must happen here. It's more than just a reaction in our mind. There's a recognition of a need in our very heart of hearts that we must cry out to Christ. We must cry out to him as Savior. Jesus wasn't just a good example. He wasn't just a powerful teacher or a mighty preacher. He is the very Son of God in the flesh, the one who was prophesied from long ago, the one who came, lived a sinless life, and died on a cross that you and I might have life. And as we wrap our time up, I want to circle back to that C.S. Lewis quote for just a minute. The C.S. Lewis lays out an argument. The synopsis of it is like this. If the evidence indicates that Jesus was a liar, or if the evidence indicates that he was out of his mind, then dismiss him as a fool. But the evidence doesn't really support that. The evidence, on the other hand, shows certainly beyond a reasonable doubt that Jesus was who he claimed to be. He was the promised Messiah, the Son of God, God in the flesh. And C.S. Lewis's argument goes like this. Well, then, the reasonable response is to fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? And we see Peter's response there in verse 16. Now the question is before us, and who do you say that Jesus is? And how will you respond to that question? Let's pray together. Father, we are so in awe of you that while we were at our absolute most sinful, you spared your absolute most precious son for us. That we might have eternal life, something we absolutely do not deserve. And Father, we thank you for your word that we can open it up and we can come to realize, even in something, a detail like just a name, a title that Jesus claimed for himself, the significance of that. That he is your Messiah. Father, I pray as we come into this time of invitation, there are some here today that don't know you. They've been walking around their, li their whole lives with the Jesus Christ baseball card in their pocket. They understand facts about you. They understand some things. But they don't know you personally. And as we come into this time of invitation, Lord, as your, as your spirit continues to speak to their hearts, Lord, I pray that you would give them the boldness to step out and just come down the front and say something as simple as, I need to know Jesus. Father, for your children here, sometimes we, we get afraid to share. We buy into the lie that the world has told us that we cannot share the truth. We back down. And Father, I pray you as we enter this time of invitation that you would continue to convict our hearts about those moments when we've not stood up for your truth. Father, we just pray that as you continue to speak in these few moments, you would help us to respond to you. We pray it in Jesus' name.